the image in Daniel 3 it's in, it's in Shinar and it's a massive international program that unites people correct? Mm -hmm. that had happened once before in the same area in your Bible of course yeah, okay, look in Genesis 11. No new thing under the sun. Oh, that looks even dirtier now, huh? It's because of the... I put them in water, but they... Isn't the Bible fun? It's amazing, man. It's Amazing. Daniel 11, uh, Daniel 11, Genesis 11, verse 1. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. Right? And they dwelt there and they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them throughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, meaning let's go. Let us build us a city and a tower whose stop may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Because what had just happened? The flood. And the Lord had told them scatter and they didn't want to scatter. They built, we forget, they didn't just build a tower. They said that we're going to build a tower and a city. And that's Babylon. Babylon is Babel. Same thing. This is the same place. You know that you can't see Babylon, the modern day Babylon on Google Maps? It's blacked out, part of Babylon, modern day Babylon. It's a funny thing, eh? That there's a base in the land of Shinar, yeah. There's a few, there's a list, I was checking up on a, on a website, it lists some places on the earth that Google Maps blocks out. There's some places on the earth that Google, you can't see on uh, Google, uh, Google Earth. Why? And Google Why? Ma Is I don't know, but, uh, but there's nothing there. There's, uh, my my father-in-law, I don't know if my, if my wife's been there, but my father-in-law's been there. I mean, it's, 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 it's a dump, what's left. There's some broken palace for Saddam Hussein because he thought he was the next Nebuchadnezzar, but there's nothing... Um, so nobody ever rebuilt there? Eh? No one ever rebuilt there? No, Nebuchadnezzar kind of tried. Nebuchadnezzar. Yeah. Saddam Hussein. <laughs> <laughs> he kind of tried. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so they build a city as well. Now, the city is the geopolitical aspect of the project. So the tower answers to the religious aspect of the project. And I, there was a religious aspect to it. The fact that the city, uh, here, here, look, here's how you know that the tower answers to uh, the, the, oh, to, uh, to the, how do you know that the, the tower answers to the religious aspect? Because what you have in Daniel 3, 1, you have an, you have an image you have an image, and you have it in Babylon. Okay. In Genesis, this is in Daniel 3. In Genesis, you have a tower, and you have a city. So if the city answers to Babylon, then the tower answers to the image. And since the image was worshipped, Odds are that the tower had some kind of religious element connected to it. And, and, and indeed they do. So you, uh, the ziggurats, you ever heard of the ziggurats? The Babylonians would build ziggurats. There were, there were Babylonian pyramids and there were the temples. So the tower has a religious, definitely has a religious connotation to it. The, that's, a, that, that's just the economic political aspect, right? That's where they, the living quarters and the, and the manpower and the engineers, the workers and all that kind of, and the rulers of the project. So the correspondence yields a double implication that this is a religious, that this, this thing is religious, but also that the image of Nebuchadnezzar, the implications that thing is also, because that's a space program. Okay, that's basically a space program. I know they, you know, so the, the idea expressed in the text is uh, we're not going to be scattered. Now they say whose top may reach unto heaven. Now that doesn't necessarily mean 
Because you've got other places like in the book of Deuteronomy, it talks about the walls of the Canaanites that reached unto heaven. So that doesn't necessarily mean, you, some people take that and say, see, whose top has reached unto heaven. So they're trying to build the tower as high as they can because they want to physically jump into space from the tower. It doesn't necessarily mean that. Because there's other expressions in the Bible that talk about structures reaching to the top of heaven. And it doesn't mean physically reaching heaven. However, however, that being said, God very, 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 very rarely personally comes down to earth. To intervene in the affairs of men. There's actually seven times that the Lord comes down. There's uh, Arthur W. Pink, despite his Calvinism, has an amazing study on that. You've got God that God is like down in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. God comes down on Mount Sinai. Right? He comes down to see Sodom, the cry of Sodom. One of the times he comes down is Genesis 11. He comes down in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the rapture, and then the and then the second advent. So you can you can so very rare, very very rare. And look, you say, but so who stopped me reach unto heaven? It couldn't possibly be to get into space. Plus they have, they don't even have stone. They have brick. They don't even have mortar. They have slime. I mean, how serious is that building project? Well, it's serious enough. God sees something there that we, we don't necessarily see. Because look in Genesis 11. And it's not just to scatter them. There is the connotation of a space program. Because look, Genesis chapter 11. Look what the Lord said in verse, says in verse, uh, in verse 5. Look, Genesis 11, 5. And the Lord came down. God doesn't get off his throne and come down for just anything. This is, I mean, all the angels are like, okay, well, this is serious. We thought it was just a bunch of guys, you know, little ants building an ant hill. God says, no, 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 no. There's something serious enough here. I'm going to come down personally. You know how many angels God's got and the four winds of the heavens and the cherubims and the seraphims at his disposal? And the Lord said, uh, he comes down to see the city and the tower. You know what the Lord is? He's a building inspector. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you might be dealing with the Lord. Many have entertained angels unawares, the Bible says. He comes down and checks it out. What do you got there? I, 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 you can, I'm, I mean, definitely, definitely. Wouldn't you do it if you were God? Wouldn't you just come down and just have fun sometimes? He did it with the disciples to Emmaus. He appeared in a different form. The Bible says that their eyes were holding. For sure, for sure. The Lord all the time just walks around, you know, starts up conversations with people. Absolutely, 100%. I mean, the Bible tells you that angels do that. So, and he does it here. And the Lord said, uh, Behold, in verse 6, the people is one. And they have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing, God's saying that. Nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Now, I know we say man is just an anthill. And the Lord said, you can do, without me, you can do nothing. And, uh, but the context is spiritual there. I, I get that. I know that man is nothing compared to God and he esteemeth the nations as nothing and less than nothing as a drop in the bucket in Isaiah. I get that. But this is God himself saying, mankind, when they work together, can pull off anything they want with no exceptions. And fallen mankind, without the powers that we had before we fell. That's God's own testimony. See, because you know, you've got a lot of people saying, Today, you know, like especially in the conspiracy world, like, oh, it's impossible that man reached the moon and goes to space. It's Wait a sec. God himself says man can do it. Now, I'm not, saying that, I'm not saying that everything NASA says is true. I don't know about the moon landing. I don't know if it's true or not. I don't really care. My point is that God says we can do it if we want to. And it's serious enough that the Lord says, look what they're starting. And here's, here's God's thinking. He says, this thing... The thing is, this is not going to stop here. That's a thinking. God is saying, this is the beginning of something that if I don't stop, because you have to remember what the context is. The context, he just flooded the world because of angels that fell down. You know what E.T. wants to do? Phone home. E.T. E. wants to go back. Who wants to stay here if we are a fallen angel? They want to go back to those stars. They want to go back to their abode. That's the Antichrist. I will, by the way, this is future. In Isaiah 14, he says, I will ascend, I will, I will, I will set my throne 
uh, in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the stars of God in the sides of the north. And we say that's Lucifer. He wanted to go up and go cast him down. That's not the context at all. At all. This is future. That's the Antichrist talking. The Antichrist on earth is going to try to get back up there. He wants to go back. Earth is a demotion, a fallen earth form. They want to go back to those stars. And so the Lord sees something dangerous. Because remember, there are giants before the flood. Yeah. Moses, there were giants in those days. And also after that. So you've got giants there with their advanced mental capacities, physical capacities. They're part angels, those guys. Mm -hmm. And they're teaching mankind what you can do. There's a comp Canadian company. There's a Canadian company a few years ago that, that uh, is, is designing... Because the cost of going to space is so expensive if you have to overcome gravity. And we're still using, uh, as far as we know, <laughs> we're still using just simple propulsion. Uh, you know, mixing hydrogen and oxygen, right? I think it is. And it, it's, it, it costs a lot just to overcome that, that initial, I guess it's inertia, just to overcome that. And then once you get into orbit, it's easier because gravity has less of a pull. and you can, It's easier. But it's very, very expensive just to shoot off those first few kilometers. So the thinking is, and it's a Canadian company designing that. It's a collapsible elevator that goes up like kilometers, kilometers. It goes like this. And then you can, you, you can, you can uh, with uh, cables, haul off equipment to the top. And then they can launch from the top. And a Canadian company is working on that. So the Lord sees that. He says, this is serious enough. I've got to stop this because they will make it. And you have an Amos and you have an Obadiah where the Lord says, though thou, shouldst, though thou, though thou settest thy nest, among the stars, from thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. So God says, I know you could reach the stars, and even if you do, I'm bringing you back down from there. So the Bible itself, and, and that's an amazing thing to me, because people say, oh, the Bible, the Bible, they were written by a bunch of goat herders that didn't understand science, and they were worshipping the moon and the stars. What other book, religious book in the world, that book tells you that you can live among the stars? Which is supposedly the modern understanding of things. Yeah, and, yeah. and so you've got twice now, the Bible, twice, Amos and Obadiah says, Though thou, set, thou setst thy nest among the stars from thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. So I'm bringing you back down. So that's a space program going, at, or it's the, it's the inception of a space program. And God says, <laughs> no. Yes? So if, let's say, the humanity ever got to the point where they're trying to start setting up things on the moon, God would... He says amongst the stars. That's the limit he gives. So, if we ever start getting... But the stars, I mean, uh, look, I don't know what the truth... You have to keep in mind. A lot of what we know about astronomy, there's two things going on. A, you have to trust your sources, which I don't know if what they're telling us is true or not. And aside the conspiracy, you've got... You've got uh, I heard a Japanese astronomer say that the highest margin of error of any science is in astronomy. He says what we think we understand about what we're looking at and I, he actually gave a number that I forgot, so I can't quote it. But it was one to the, I don't know how power. I'm, he says, when it comes to astronomy, we, like, our margin of error about what we're seeing and describing is... is, is so, so given that, the closest star, they tell us, is Alpha Centauri, which is uh, 4.2 light years. 4.2 light years is 4.2 years of traveling at almost 300,000 kilometers per second, not per hour. Per second. Yeah, well, I, I, I don't really... Uh, God placed us there. There's no real... So, okay, so, the star, so our sun does not count. No, no. The stars. Yeah, he says amongst the stars. So I don't think we're going to get uh, too much nearer to the sun. Uh, yeah, so... Okay, so the inception of a space program. Now watch this. <clears throat> Tower of Babel. Uh, I wish I had a projector someday if we get to uh, a, a place where we can... Because to project, it's kind of hard here. And I use the board. The European Parliament... Have you ever seen pictures of the European Parliament in Strasbourg? During the break... You know, it's hard to believe that stuff. It's, it's just hard to believe, but it's, it's there. You can, it's the building. The European Parliament is built like this. You can check it during the break, okay? It's built like a tower. That's the European Parliament in Strasbourg. And they've left off the scaffolding on the outside as part of the structure, decorative scaffolding. So the European Parliament is built consciously like the Tower of Babel and the decorative scaffolding is part of the structure. I can, it's probably too far for you to see, but uh, 
it was designed to look like an unfinished Tower of Babel to send the message that what we started in Genesis 11, we're going to do. It's got a 60 meter tower. It's a 60 meter tower. Right? You get, I don't know if you can see it. But that's a European Parliament. It's built like a tower. And uh, it was Glenn Beck and others before him that said that you could take a pic. There's a famous painting by uh, Peter Bruegel of the Tower of Babel. And it's, it, it looks like it was based on that painting, the, the structure, the way it's built. I mean, that, it's just, that's European Parliament. They have a. Um, <clears throat> this is a poster that says Europe, many tongues, one voice. And what that is, remember Tower of Babel, when they were building the Tower of Babel, it was uh, of one language, one speech. In 1887, L.L. L. Zamenhof laid the foundation of an international language today known as Esperanto. It is the most widely spoken, constructed international auxiliary language in the world. In 1954, the United Nations officially recognized Esperanto as an international auxiliary language in the Montevideo Resolution. They're, and they're, they're, they're pumping uh, money into that to have, well, they don't want English as the lingua franca of Europe. And so they've built a language to unite Europe and the European Parliament is based off of uh, the idea of a Tower of Babel. Outside the Winston Churchill building for the European Parliament, is a woman riding a beast. Of course, there's Revelation 17. And it's because it's Europa that sat on Zeus. That's right outside the European Parliament. You can go visit that stuff. A woman riding a beast. Because that's, that's what Europe, Europe is a Lebanese girl, Europa, in, in most of the stories. And Zeus, God, shows up as a white bull and he kidnaps her to Europe. It's a woman riding a beast where it's Revelation 17. So what that means, what that's telling you is, whatever Nebuchadnezzar was doing had connections, at least in an inception, to, to a space program. Now, I'm not saying if, uh, I'm not saying that, you know, if you're part of NASA that you're satanic. I have two uncles that have worked or still work with NASA. And one of them is a born-again Christian, and, he's, and he's, he's a faithful Christian too. Okay, so I'm not saying that. But just because you work for the United Nations doesn't mean you're working for the Antichrist. That, I mean, Nab, I mean ba Daniel himself is working for Babylon, right? So I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm not saying anything like that. What I'm saying is that those, 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 there's uh, some dark forces behind those things. NASA itself, the beginning of NASA, is very much connected to the occult. And this is nothing to hit. You can just easily, you can easily read about that and find out a lot of information on that. You guys ever heard of the name of Alex, Alec, uh, Edward Alexander Crowley? He was, a, he was actually a brethren, and he founded uh, uh, modern-day Satanism, basically, in the United States. So what, what, what that guy is, I'll tell you in a second who that guy is. You'll see where the connection is going to come in. Okay, listen to this. <clears throat> he, he became homosexual, and he discovered the occult. He drops out of university, this guy. This is in uh, early, uh, late 19th century. And he gets associated with the Freemasons, and... Uh, he marries a girl and he goes down to Cairo in Egypt. This is NASA. The beginning, this, is gonna, this is gonna tie into NASA. He goes down to Egypt and during that trip she takes him to a museum and uh, she sees a stele, like a, a picture, known as Anchen Honsu, whose exhibit number was 666. According to Crowley's later statements, on April 8th he heard a disembodied voice that claimed to be that of Iwas, the messenger of the Egyptian god Horus. Crowley said that he wrote down everything the voice told him on the, uh, over the next three days and titled the book Liber al Velegis, the book of the law. The book proclaimed that humanity was entering a new aeon. Remember last time we studied about the new age that's coming? Aeon is Greek for age. And that Crowley would serve as its prophet. It stated that a supreme moral law was to be introduced in this aeon. And the law is this, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. That's, the, that's a quote. Founder of modern day Satanism, this guy. And that people should learn to live in tune with their will. This book and the philosophy that it espoused became the cornerstone of Crowley's new religion, Thelema. If all that sounds esoteric to you, if you're saying well, that's crazy, weird stuff, what's the connection to me? Consider the pop culture connection. You guys ever heard of uh, the Beatles? You ever heard of uh, the most famous album of all time? 
Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club. Okay, that is, that's the album that created albums. There was no such thing as albums. The albums came to existence because of that. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. No, okay, well, see, that's why we have that. So we'll try to fix it during break. That's weird. Okay, so <clears throat> Rolling Stone magazine ranked that album number one on its list of 500 greatest albums of all time. Okay, keep in mind, okay, we're, we're discussing music. Remember, Daniel 3 is music. Okay, so keep that. Try to keep those things in your mind. As of 2011, the album had sold over 32 million copies worldwide. Professor Kevin J. Detmar, writing in the Oxford Encyclopedia of British Literature, described it as the most important and influential rock and roll album ever recorded. Now, here's why this is important. The album cover is famous. Anybody is familiar with that? You ever heard? You've probably seen it and you don't even know what it was. It's a picture of the Beatles standing in the front with like dressed in like very colorful clothing and they're surrounded by like a hundred historical personages. It's nothing but people on the cover standing behind them. And what it was is they wanted to convey that those are the people that have influenced us and why we've become so great that we want to pass on their philosophy. Those are the good people that we represent. That's the, I mean, this is their statements. I'm not making that stuff up. You can pull all that stuff during break and watch it. Okay, you know who the, some of the people are on that most famous album of all time on the cover? Listen to this. A motley crew of the Marquis de Sade. You know who that guy is, you just don't know it. You ever heard the term sadism? When people derive pleasure out of hurting others? Marquis de Sade was a French nobleman and he used to do that. That's where the word sadism comes from, from the Marquis de Sade. So they put that guy on their album, most famous album of all time. Marquis de Sade, <clears throat> Friedrich Nietzsche, whose philosophy helped Hitler, in, encourage uh, Hitler in the, in the Holocaust. Adolf Hitler is on the cover. And Aleister Crowley. You say, what's the connection between the Beatles and the, modern, the founder of modern day Satanism? In September 1980, three months before his death, John Lennon would tell an interviewer of Playboy magazine, the whole Beatle idea was to do what you want, right? Take your own responsibility. Although Lennon did not quote Crowley verbatim, both proponents of the occult and Christians have argued that Lennon's reference to the Beatle idea as, quote, do what you want, is actually a restatement of Crowley's law of Telema, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of, of the law. By the way, most famous song ever voted by the Brits as their favorite song of all time was Imagine by John Lennon. The Tower of Babel, the description of, and, and the flood, the Lord saw that the heart of the imagination, of the, the thoughts of the imagination of the heart of man was only evil continually. And in that line, he says, imagine all the people, he says, and no religion too. They imagine no heaven, no hell, and no religion too. That became the, the drug and the religion of those young people in, this, in the 60s and 70s and 50s. Okay, let's tie it up now. Uh, recall our connection to music and worship. So what you've got so far, well, how does Alistair Crowley though connect to NASA? Enter one John Whiteside, Jack Parsons. Jack Parsons was an American rocket engineer. He's actually the father of modern rocket science, Jack Parsons. The guy, what he did, uh, he was a rocket propulsion researcher, a chemist and a consultant for the Israeli rocket program. He was associated with the California Institute of Technology, Caltech, if you've heard of it. Parsons was one of the principal founders of both NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the Aerojet Engineering Corporation. He invented the first rocket engine to use a castable composite rocket propellant and pioneered the advancement of both liquid fuel and solid fuel rockets. Parsons supposedly learns about Aleister Crowley while taking a couple of night classes at the University of Southern California. So he and his wife Helen joined the Los Angeles branch of Crowley's Otto Ordo Templi Orientis. It's a secret lodge uh, where Crowley is dissip uh, dissipating his, is, is, uh, disseminating his religion. So Parsons joins Crowley and he becomes a member of that cult. That's the father of, rocket of modern day rocket science guys. By the way, what I'm telling you used to be on NASA's website and I have the quote and I just found out today that NASA purged the guy's name from their website. 
And I went out and checked and I found articles about that saying they, they took out Jack, Jack Parsons from their website, but I have the original quote because I did my research on that wow. before 2018. Wow. Okay, so listen to this. Here's what happens. While pursuing magic, Parsons is also working with Theodore. <laughs> this is amazing stuff. While pursuing magic, he's working with Theodore von, von Karman. And he's working with Frank Molina and Ed Foreman at Caltech. You say, who are those guys? So there was something called, you ever heard of Project Paperclip? So what happens is, after World War II, those uh, German scientists were brilliant. They really were. I mean, the a lot of technology you have today comes back to World War II. The V-2 rocket that was terrorizing the Brits, the ability to launch rockets, was, was a formidable weapon in the hands of the Germans. And had the war gone on longer, had they been able to use the V-2 rockets more, the Allies would have probably lost. So after World War II, yeah, the Allies have won, but you've got all those brilliant scientists. You want to hang them, but you want to use them. <laughs> So there was a project to secretly, and this is declassified information, because in the States, after 25 years, you can declassify the information. This is, again, nothing that people deny. This is out in the open. You can do your own research. Project Paperclip was, at the time, a secret U.S. project to bring those brilliant engineers and scientists into the States and use them to develop their space program and their weapons engineering, because the communists had come in and split Germany in half, and Stalin was taking his own German scientists. So you don't want the guy to end up with the V2 technology, you want it for yourself. So a lot of them went to live in Arizona and had nice lives and, and made millions of dollars and worked on NASA projects and, and, and um, <laughs> so, you know, because they, they were useful to them. So if those names, so these are the guys that he's working for. Just to give you an idea, Von Karman was a Hungarian-American mathematician, aerospace engineer and physicist, who was active primarily in the fields of aeronautics and astro astronautics. He's responsible for many key advances in aerodynamics, notably his work on supersonic and hypersonic airflow characterization. He's regarded as the outstanding aerodynamic theoretician of the 20th century. Frank Molina was an aeronautical engineer. So uh, here's what I took from their website before they purge it. Now I'm going to quote from NASA, from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory website. Listen to this. Yeah, here's why that stuff was pulled. CBS in 2018, and I remember reading about it that was coming up. They had a, CBS did a whole thing on Jack Parsons, and they called him Strange Angel. That's what they called him. Father of modern rocket science. The, the guy behind the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. My uncle worked with the JPL. And this guy, they, CBS does this whole special on them, and when they do a whole special on him and his stuff with magic and weirdness, NASA purges the references to him from their website, but I have the quote from before the purge. So here's what it says. This is NASA. The Rocket Boys were an unusual bunch. That's what they called them. Frank Molina was studying aerodynamics at Caltech's Guggenheim Aeronautical Laboratory, known as Galsit. Jack Parsons was a self-taught chemist, and Ed Foreman was an excellent mechanic. They scraped together cheap engine parts, and on October 31st, Halloween, drove to an isolated area called the Arroyo Seco at the foot of the San Gabriel Mountains. I think that's Arizona. Arroyo Seco means dry, dry stream. This would be the first rocket test in modern history, and JPL marks this experiment as its foundation. So NASA says, what that guy did on Halloween night, that was our foundation. You know what the guy was doing on that, on that night? <laughs> While he was launching the rockets, he was singing hymns to Pan and in doing a magic incantation to open up a portal because uh, to, to bring in spirits. That's his testimony. This is open knowledge. And that's why when CBS did the special, NASA said, there's enough people that think we're crazy. Let's get this guy out. Now what it reads, it just says a bunch of rocket, uh, amateur rocket engineers without names. Mm -hmm. and, like, you know, you also said, yeah, you said you're afraid of those geniuses. And it, yeah. and it said he was a self-taught Yes, chemist. right, yes. So he was he, brilliant. Yeah. yeah. So he dies at age 37. He had communist affiliations and he dies preparing for the movies, the special effects, and they blew up and killed him. But some people suspect murder because some of the details don't uh, come together. So he would recite hymns to Pan, the devilish god, in an ecstatic manner compared to the preaching of Billy Graham during the rocket tests. 
Par now, in 46, Jack Parsons teams up with L. Ron Hubbard. You know who L. Ron Hubbard is? Again, you know, you just don't know that you know. You guys know who Tom Cruise is? Yeah, Tom Cruise, you know, the actor. You know what his religion is? Scientology. L. Ron Hubbard is the founder of Scientology. So Jack Parsons teams up with L. Ron Hubbard. L. Ron Hubbard steals, steals his girlfriend, rips him off, off the money, and, uh, but they start doing all kinds of, uh, of uh, magic rituals together to incarnate the female devil which Crowley called, which Crowley calls Babylon. The great mother, Parsons called her the Scarlet Woman. Again, if all that stuff sounds weird to you, just consider, keep in mind that modern day famous people that follow this stuff include Tom Cruise, John Travolta, Kelly Preston, Priscilla Presley, Christy Alley, Beck, Vivian Kubrick, daughter of Stanley Kubrick, the movie maker, Juliette Lewis, Danny Masterson, Elizabeth Moss, the, the, the supermodel, Giovanni Ravisi, the actor, Chick Corea, Greta von Susteren of Fox News. Parsons began to lose his mind and the FBI eventually stripped Parsons of his clearance because of his subversive character, including his involvement and advocacy of sexual perversion. And we've come full circle to the 20th century. Are the Freemasons tied into that too? I mean, yeah, they, yeah, 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 they are, yeah. They have like yeah, yeah, they are, yeah. yeah. They are. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And so what you, what you get is all those, those space programs. Here's, I think, where the conspiracists kind of miss out. I don't think so much the conspiracy is, is deceiving people about, and of course they deceive people about the age of the universe and evolution, that kind of stuff. But if you go with the Bible verses, the unbeknownst to the rank and file worker of those organizations, the idea there, remember, the devil knows what's coming. And the devil knows he's going to get kicked out of heaven. And the angels are going to show up here on earth. And according to Daniel chapter 8, the Antichrist is going to exalt himself so high that he reaches the stars of heaven and he casts out a third of them to the ground and he tramples on them. And you've got that in Revelation chapter 12. The dragon with his tail casts out a third. And the tail, according to Isaiah, is the false prophet. So I think what those guys are, unbeknownst to them, the powers that be that are giving them technology and influencing, influencing them, we benefit from a lot of that technology. There's nothing wrong with it. But the goal behind that stuff is to help the Antichrist storm back the gates of heaven. Don't forget, in Revelation chapter 12, you've got a battle between uh, the, 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 the dragon and uh, his angels in heaven. And they get cast out. He's going to need a way back up there. Remember when the Lord says in John chapter 10, he says, he that climbeth up, he's talking about heaven, and the shepherd that, he says, the shepherd goes out, the portal opens to, the porter opens the portal, and he goes out, and he calls his sheep by name, and he leadeth them out. That's a rapture. John 10 tells you that's a parable. That's a parable. That's a parable of Christ coming out. In Revelation 19, John sees a, a door open in heaven. Jacob, when he's asleep in, in Genesis 28, he sees heaven open and a ladder reaching up to heaven and the, and the angels ascending and descending upon the ladder. And he says, this is the gate of heaven and he builds Bethel, house of God. There's a portal there to the third heaven in that area, according to Jacob himself. So the Lord says, and it's a parable. And John says, they didn't understand what he's talking about. The Lord says, the porter opens and the shepherd comes out and he calls his own sheep by name. Well, that's how you get raptured. Come up hither. That's a, he's discussing the rapture of the Lord. He, the door opens in heaven. The Lord shows up. He calls us by name. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we get taken up to heaven. In the same passage, the Lord says, He that climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. And if you remember, we go up there to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And the Lord says that at the marriage, there's going to be a guy that's there. And the Lord says, How did you get in here? And the Lord says, You don't have a wedding garment on. Get out of here. And he's kicked out to outer darkness. So it certainly sounds like somebody's going to be following us. <laughs> and you have that imagery, of course. Now, when we get raptured up into heaven, you know, there's a, there's a body of water. We're going to go through it. It's the deep. You, 
Praise the Lord, you waters that be above the heavens. Psalm 144 or 45. And we go through it. And that's what you have in the Exodus. That body of water, you have a people being redeemed out and being led of the Lord, but somebody's chasing them. And they get destroyed on the way. So there's quite a possibility that we get chased. And the Lord just goes... <laughs> you know? And the devil's going to try to find a way back up there. Now, I don't know if you know this, but the Vatican owns two uh, observatories. And you got to say, I mean, like, why? Why? One of them is in Mount Graham. With the conditions there are some of the best for observing, uh, observing space. So... <clears throat> They, there's a lot of misinformation about that thing. You can go check the details in the notes, but I'll just, I'll give you the actual truth about this because some people write books just to be sensational so they can sell or get clicks. So the, the facility there is shared between the Vatican and the Max Planck Institute, but they operate an object, a tool to look into the heavens, and the tool is called the LBT Near Infrared Spectroscopic Utility with Camera and Integral Field Unit for Extra Galactic Research. And the acronym, and people have, and I mean, lost people have written about that. And the acronym for that tool is Lucifer. It's the L LBT, I, I, I have it in the notes what an LBT is. L it's the LBT Near Infrared Spectroscope, Near Infrared Spectroscopic LBT, Near Infrared Spectroscopic, it's utility with camera and integral field unit for extra galactic research and so laws guys interviewed the vatican they're like okay so yeah we got it it's technical but come on like of all possible acronyms did you really have to pick one that's cruiser and so you say well that's just they say well that's just uh the acronym is just uh it's a fluke yeah. they've got built another one they've called it lucifer too oh. <laughs> i'm not kidding so nice. i have the notes you can check it they're all in the notes uh, Rebecca Boyle has an article about that. Now listen to this. <clears throat> listen to this. The Vatican may not have named the instruments, but the connections are too close for comfort. They could be dismissed were it not for the Vatican's own stated positions on extraterrestrial life. You know what the Vatican officially teaches on extraterrestrial life? This is Jose Funes. He's an Argentine Jesuit priest and astronomer and the current director of the Vatican Observatory. He's interviewed by the Vatican Daily, L'Osservatore Romano, whereof the Catholic news agency reports the following. The director of the Vatican's observatory, uh, Friar Jose Gabriel Funes, said in an interview with the Vatican Daily that believing in the possible existence of extraterrestrial life is not opposed to Catholic doctrine. The 45-year-old Argentine... Remember the Zechariah 5, the stuff that's going all over the earth. The 45-year-old Argentinian priests, priest heads the Vatican observatory founded by Pope Leo XIII in Arizona. He began the interview titled, quote, The alien is my brother, by saying that, quote, Astronomy has a profound human value in this regard, and here I speak as a priest and a Jesuit. It is an apostolic instrument that can bring us closer to God. He says he personally believes that the Big Bang Theory seems to him the most plausible, and you can't ask the Bible for a scientific answer. And uh, he says... I agree with St. Francis, who was the patron of animals. If we consider some earthly creatures and brothers or sisters, why could we not speak of a brother alien? He would also belong to the creation. And listen to this. Father Funes says that, the, that taking the image of the lost sheep in the gospel, we could think that in this universe, there can be a hundred sheep equivalent to different kinds of creatures. We belonging to the humankind could be precisely the lost sheep, the sinners that need the shepherd. God became man in Jesus to save us. In that way, assuming that there would be other intelligent beings, we could not say that they need redemption. And the idea is, it says, we're the lost sheep in the hundred, and there are 99 other extraterrestrial races. So basically, they're sinless. So when they show up, they're the saviors. And on and on, I've got, you can read all the rest, uh, on and on and on and on, it goes... Uh, Give me five minutes, uh, five, we'll finish early, okay? Give me five minutes and I'm done because the thought is connected. Again, if you're too tired, you can just look at the video uh, um, after. The world is seeking unto the gods. Remember we were talking about they're looking for saviors from outer space? If now the Vatican's saying the aliens could be our brothers, and he actually said he would baptize the alien if he showed up. So, 
Okay. <laughs> you guys ever heard of CERN? I don't know, but uh, I, I'm saying it's they're running observatories and they're saying whatever's coming from space would be our brother and they don't need redemption. Yeah. So it's, some kind of it's, it's just, you know, and the, and the instrument's called Lucifer. I mean, yeah. it's just a bit strange. Okay, it's a bit strange. All right, what CERN is, last, last, last part, okay, hang in there, guys, we're almost done and we'll, and we'll finish early. CERN is the Conseil Européen pour la Recherche Nucléaire. It's a provisional body that was founded in 1952 with the mandate of establishing a world-class fundamental physics research organization in Europe. If you remember uh, uh, 2008, it was all over the news, they were looking for the Higgs, uh, uh, the Higgs part, the God particle they called it. So um, Higgs, Higgs theorized the existence of, of a specific kind of particle and what, the, what that thing is, it's the biggest machine that exists in the world today. It, it's completely underground, it's nine billion dollars, it's buried at a depth of 575 feet. The tunnel complex runs along a 17 mile circuit, 27 kilometers. And it's under uh, France and Switzerland and completely buried underground. Israel is the only non-European country to have uh, full membership. It's one of Europe's first joint ventures and now has 22 states. And uh, it's also it has an observer status at the United Nations, as if it's a state, the people who run that machine, that country. And so what that is, it's a, it's a cyclotron. It shoots, it shoots at like near light speed, near light speed speeds. <laughs> it shoots particles. It whizzes them through those tunnels. And when the particles collide, there's a, there's a very, very, very brief explosion there. And they've got very sensitive instruments and they, they study that explosion and they think that gives them an understanding into how the Big Bang started. Nine billion dollars for that machine under Switzerland and France, and it's got observer status at the United Nations. It's not there's nobody that that uh, no nation runs that. It's completely independent. The biggest scientific endeavor on planet Earth right now. It's a monster. That thing was so dangerous that there was a German uh, physicist that took him to court. Said if you collide those particles and you create a black hole, you're gonna all suck us out out of existence. You the only non-European full member. Yeah, okay. So, if all that stuff seems weird to you, the guy, uh, the, the guy that works there, one of the guys that, uh, okay, you know what was invented there? <laughs> the internet. This stuff is closer to you than you think. Tim Berners-Lee. Tim Berners-Lee, the, 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 the project is so massive that he was designing a system that people inside the organization could communicate between each other in a closed system. And that's how it became the internet. And he gave it for free outside to, after to the outside world. So the internet is developed at CERN. So it's closer, those stuff is closer to you than you think. One year after CERN's grand opening, Sergio Bertolucci, former director for research and scientific computing of the facility, made headlines when he told a British tabloid that the super collider could open otherworldly doors to other dimensions for a tiny lapse of time. Quote, to peer into this door either by getting something out of it or sending something into it. The director said that. He says, if we can, if we can hit those, if we can smash those things together, you can rip the fabric of space-time that Einstein spoke about. And if you rip the fabric of space-time, then instead of traveling along this line, you can, you can get, uh, uh, you, can, you can get, you can kind of fold space together and you can connect. And the traveling distance is a lot smaller. He says, we could send something out. We got an opening in space-time. We can send out a, send out a satellite or, or, or a rover or something, some kind of uh, sensory instrument, and, or we can get something in. Now, so remember, we were it's connected to what you heard two weeks ago where the, the angels that first fell in Genesis chapter 6 corrupted mankind the old-fashioned way. They just came in unto the daughters of women. But we were saying that Daniel says there's some stuff that shows up from the heavens and they, they're going to uh, mingle themselves with the seed of men next time because God closed that door. So the angels are going to try with technology to circumvent that by corrupting mankind. So it's quite possible that 
the Lord has closed a lot of those doors and now the devil, just like man, just like man, the Lord kicked us out of the garden. What do we do? We invent ACs to keep us cool, right? We invent things to keep us from like sweating. We invent things to numb the pain. And so the devil is doing the exact same thing. He's got one door close to him. He says, well, I'm going to figure out a way that I'm going to get back there. Or I'm going to open up a portal to get those angels down here. To bring in my backups. In 2016, CERN launched an investigation into a video filmed that night on its Geneva campus depicting a mock ritual human sacrifice before the image of Shiva, the goddess of destruction. Usually scientific organizations don't want any connection to a religion. They avoid it. They brought in a huge statue of Shiva and because she's, she's uh, inside a circle, which is typical of the cyclotron. So what some people, so a lot of people are saying this stuff is weird. So some of the guys with the passes Put a, did a video of a human sacrifice, a mock human sacrifice, and uploaded it to YouTube. And it's got, it got millions of views. And so the journalists are saying, what's going on? And the director, she's saying, well, they have passes. And because there's so many conspiracy theories about us, they just wanted to prank the world. And that's why they did that. Very elaborate with cam different camera angles and stuff like that. So this is, <laughs> the, the, this is what we guys are what we're dealing with. That the, the, the idea that we're going to have... Uh, space, we'll call it tonight tonight, okay? It's been so long, we'll call it tonight after this. So the idea that we're waiting for saviors, uh, like in Genesis chapter 6, to come and save us. The whole world is ready for it. Everybody says, we have a problem with climate, we have a problem with politics, we can't stop wars, we can't stop hunger, we've got cancer, this world is aching for a savior. Now they don't want Jesus Christ. The Lord says, I came in my Father's name, you didn't receive me, another's going to come in his own name. And when he shows up, he's got to ready the world for it. So you've got, if you look at, you, you can't be disconnected from, from pop culture too much. If um, all those movies, there's always two themes about it. And there are, it's always about space. I, I, we try to put on a cartoon for our kids. Sometimes Caillou, because he's like, ah, but... Yeah, the French, but like I don't really, I, th I find a bit of, the kid is a bit, is a bit of a weakling. He's just, I just want to slap him around. But, so I'm not sure I want my kids watching that. But uh, it's all like, it's like no maleness to him at all. There's just no masculinity. So, but the idea is this, that like, like it's Caillou. And sure enough, there's an alien episode. You know, you can't escape that stuff anymore. In the movies, you've got two themes going. You've got one where... <coughs> Uh, the aliens that show up are misunderstood and they mean well and a bunch of stupid politicians and usually hillbilly Protestant deer hunting Americans who are not as educated as the Yankees up north want to shoot them but that's because they misunderstand that they're so much more advanced than we are and they've come here to save us there was a famous movie in the 80s like that uh, with Jeff Bridges that started the, that whole genre I forget what it's called now but you know the guy shows up and he there's a dead deer, a hunter had just killed a dead deer and it's on the trunk in the, in the pickup and uh, that, that alien comes up to the deer and he puts his hand on the deer and, and he gives life again to the deer, you know. That whole thing about E.T. is a friendly person. There's you got a whole genre of movies where the aliens are, are misunderstood and they're here to help mankind and they're here to save mankind. The Muslim Persians, again it's all in the book, you've got Muslims. It, that stuff was completely unaccepted in the Muslim world. Now in Iran, you've got Muslim students asking cleric about aliens, and he tells them, the Shiites now believe that their Messiah, Al-Mahdi, the 13th Imam, is going to come back on a spaceship. Okay, so the, the, even the Shiite world is ready for that. So you've got that, or you've got the other side, where uh, Earth is being, you know, war of the worlds kind of scenario, where Earth is being conquered by evil uh, space aliens, and, man, and finally, it helps mankind unite. That's what's going to unite us. And we're going to forget our differences and we're going to turn our guns on the aliens and destroy the aliens and we're going to save the world. It's one of those two themes. There's no, 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 that's it. Those are, those are the two. In, a, in his 19... The, listen, this stuff has been being programmed for a while. In a 1987 UN speech on alien threat, Ronald Reagan famously declared, perhaps we need some outside universal threat. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from the outside world. During his career, 
Reagan repeatedly cited alien threats. On Jimmy Kimmel, 2014, the 42nd president of the States, Bill Clinton, said, quote, if we were visited someday, I wouldn't be surprised. I just hope it's not like Independence Day, the movie, that it's a conflict. Maybe the only way to unite this increasingly divided world of ours, if they're out there, think of how all the differences among people on Earth would seem small if we were threatened by a space invader. But that is exactly the setup. Remember, we're going to finish after this, okay? Not even break, we're going to get to go home. Look in Revelation 19. You know who those aliens are? I, it finally dawned on me a couple of years ago. It finally dawned on me. I mean, usually they tend to be clean movies uh, because there's not, not necessarily like anything sexual in there or bad words. And I like action stuff. And it gets my, my, my mental juices going when I watch stuff like that. And my wife hates it because I'm telling her how it connects to this and it connects to that. And she's like, she says, I just want to watch the movie. <laughs> okay? But um, so... Uh, it, it dawned on me after a while, because every time mankind is the hero and there's no mention of God, if you ever notice, it's never, they, and not even, they try to be so realistic, but there's never a scene of people that get down and pray to their God. Even if it's a Muslim God, there's never that scene. It's all nothing but human ingenuity and resources and, you know, just grit that are going to save the day every single time. And it finally started dawning on me, because you're watching the movie and you're with mankind. And it just, it finally dawned on me, wait a second. The aliens are the good guys. Because what they're preparing the world to fight against us when we come back. Look in Revelation 19. <clears throat> verse 11, Revelation 19, 11. Revelation 19, 11, 11. And I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse. And he that sat... On him was called faithful and, in tr and true and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Mm -hmm. And look who follows him. You. Mm -hmm. This is your future. Verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. That is a space invasion. Mm -hmm. This is aliens, which just means stranger, coming from heaven to take over the, the world. Mm -hmm. And mankind's reaction to that is, look in verse 19. 1919 and I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army that's the Avengers fighting against the aliens invading New York and by the way those things if you read if you see that movie the, the main scenes are the aliens climbing up buildings you remember that the skyscrapers in New York if you saw the movie look in Joel chapter 2 that's a right ripoff from Joel chapter 2. That's us. We will literally be doing that. Without harness and rope. <laughs> Look at Joel chapter 2. Here's your future. Congratulations, you're the space invaders. <laughs> Joel chapter 2 verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion. And sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess. Like in the movies. You know, the sky becomes dark and you've got the dark clouds. This is Joel chapter 2, verse 2 now. A day of clouds and of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains. This is you now, a great people and a strong, there hath not been ever the like. Neither shall there be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. Why? Because we come down at the, at the, end, at the beginning of the millennium, and again, this, at the end of the millennium, we fight when the devil is loose a second time. Those are the many generations. Verse 3, A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness, yea, and nothing shall escape them. The appearance of them is as the appearance of horses, and as horsemen, so shall they run. What did you read in Revelation 19? Christ shows up on horses of white fire, and we're behind him on horses of white fire. This is the Lord's army. He's going to say it soon. Verse 5. Like the noise of chariots on the tops of mountains shall they leap. Like the noise of a flame of fire that devoureth a stubble, as a strong people set in battle array. Before their face, the people of the earth shall be much pained. All faces shall gather blackness. They get burnt. They shall run like mighty men. They shall 
climb the wall like men of war, and they shall march everyone on his ways, and they shall not break their ranks, neither shall one thrust another, they shall walk everyone in his path, and when they fall upon the sword, they shall not be wounded. Why? No? Uh, is... Right, you've got your new body, congratulations. Uh, yeah, you can, yeah, that you're right. Yeah, the resurrection body, you're absolutely right. That's you. So when the, the heavens open and we've got those super powerful aliens, that's us coming down. And what, how the, listen, how does the mouth, how do this, how, if, if, think about that. You've got uh, Psalm chapter two, you know, famous Psalm. He says, uh, uh, the, the, the people, the, why do the, uh, the people imagine a vain thing? Why do the heathen rage? And the people imagine a vain thing. The kings of the earth set themselves against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us cast their bands asunder. Let us break the brands asunder. Let us cast away their cords from us. And you've got the three spirits that are coming out of the mouth of the, uh, of the dragon and the, and the antichrist, the false prophet, and they gather the kings of the earth to come to battle. How do you frame it? How do you, fr how do you convince people saying, we're going to fight against God, guys? Who would take betting now? You know, who's going to take the bets? What are the betting odds? This is not trying to defeat Donald Trump. This is taking on Jesus Christ, you know? Who, like, how, do you, how do you get people motivated for something like that? There's absolutely no chance. You frame it. What you frame it as, this is not really Jesus. Those are the evil monsters that we've been showing you for years and mankind can overcome them. Remember, we can overcome them and the people are really going to believe that they're saving the planet. And so, so you've got those two themes. So now what you've got is at the mid-trib, at the mid-trib point, the guys that show up, those guys, he wants to frame them as the saviors because they're his. Because those are the guys that help him go into the temple, take over the temple, and I am God. Three and a half years later, there's somebody else that shows up. So the frame at this point is, well, the first, the first batch, they were framed as saviors. The second batch, he's going to say, I'm the real Jesus. <laughs> All right, he's the devil, he's a deceiver of the nations. Says, I'm the real Jesus, I'm in the temple. This is, this is an alien, you know, those are the evil wicked angels that are coming to, to, to take away what we've got. And he's going to convince mankind to fight against them. They shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. But they shall not cleave one another, even as iron does, does not mix with clay. All that stuff is happening under your eyes. And you've got, and Daniel says that, and then he shows you about an evil king in Babylon, sending up an image that you have to worship in Babel, where the people had built a space program. All those things tie in to a very wicked plan to prepare the way for the Antichrist and his angels to show up and fight against the Lord. But... The three Hebrew children did not bow and you're going to have tribulation Jews. They're going to say, you can burn us. And the Bible says they're going to fa fall by flame and by captivity. Flame in Daniel. And that's exactly those three Hebrew children are a picture of tribulation Jews that when the Antichrist shows up, and he says, I'm God, worship me. They're going to say, we may burn like Lester Olaf says in the song. We may burn, but we'll never bend. And you'll have Jews that will reject and they will die and they will be resurrected three and a half years later to reign for a thousand years with Jesus Christ. So that story there that you're reading in Daniel chapter 3 is a picture of tribulation Jews refusing to worship the Antichrist and that will die by flame. But some of them are miraculously delivered by the Lord. Okay, let's close it up for tonight.